Hi, and welcome to this special edition of the Production Channel. I'm your host, Clem Harrod, and as many of you know, I was a freelancer in the live event production industry for 15 years before I created my company, Clemco AV. With a mission to coach, lead, educate, and mentor independent contractors and small business owners, specifically in our industry, we began creating resources and communities like the Production Channel, Video Projection and Support Group, Spouses of AV Workers, Clemco HR, and Clemco U, to name a few. Through the various platforms, our network has been able to connect with thousands of people, and we've seen lives change right before our faces. What we then realized from hearing all of your stories and life experiences was that there's no framework or guide to create and maintain a successful business as a freelancer or independent contractor. Therefore, we felt it necessary to take our mission to the next level, and we decided to publish our first book, Career Projection 101, An Independent Contractor's Guide to a Successful Business and Balanced Life. Based on my personal journey as an independent contractor and retiring from a sector of the industry, I was determined to understand how to best manage this freelance lifestyle and share my findings with you. You see, I've studied television production since middle school and have followed that passion into a beautiful career with many adventures. However, at no point in my education did I study, or was suggested to study, business. Many would ask, well, why would you? Why would you take business classes? As an independent contractor, sole proprietor, freelancer, you are a small business. You are responsible for your branding, your marketing, job acquisitions, scheduling, invoicing, etc. In addition, you are also responsible for budgeting, bookkeeping, quarterly and annual taxes, business insurance, health insurance, mental, physical health, and ultimately, your long-term financial planning. It's a lot, I know. I had to learn all of this the hard way, but that's why I wrote my book, Career Projection 101, so that you didn't have to go through the same struggles that I did. So let's talk about why we're here today. Throughout my journey, I've had the opportunity to meet several friends, colleagues, and professional service providers who have helped me navigate my career and create a life beyond my wildest dreams. Today, we're going to sit down with some of them and have a conversation around converting a gig-to-gig -gig lifestyle into a profitable business model with a long-term plan for continued success. Enjoy. Projection 101. Thank you for joining me. Hey guys, how are you? Great. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So our panelists, we have Patrick Murtha, who is a founding partner with his accounting firm, Jessica Barnhill, who is a health insurance agent and advisor, Jason Grundy, a financial analyst working in professional athletes and major corporations, Tom Bollard, who's a technical director for corporation business meetings, an independent contractor himself, and an adjunct professor for theater students in the uh, San Diego area. So, you know, I'm just looking at everyone here and thinking about all of the years of professional and career developed experience. I mean, it's at least 75 years of professional experience. So I know there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom that, you know, that we have to share. Um, you know, you all have either, let me see, read my book or been an active participant in the development of Career Projection 101 and you know, understanding the framework that it provides for independent contractors, freelancers, entrepreneurs, small business owners to create and sustain a successful business and balanced life. Tom, you wrote the forward. So let's start with you. I'm asking from the lens of the first act in the book. How do I get started? How do I get clients? How do I find sure. a specialty? How do I build relationships? Through your years of working with students, studying theater technology, hiring independent contractors in the live event production industry, the business that you owned, and now being an independent contractor yourself, 
What benefits do you see in looking at yourself like a business? Well, I think it's, it's as important, if not more important than ever, that each person in our business um, really creates their, their brand to make themselves as easily hired as possible. There's fewer people that are actually working as W-2 employees of companies and a lot more people that are um, independent contractors. And to get noticed and to get hired, you really need to make it as easy as possible to be hired. And um, 35 years as a business owner, um, hiring independent contractors, really we, what we looked for was, um, was that brand that people spent the time doing. So um, I think that building that brand all the way through your career, as opposed to starting later in your career is vitally important. Yeah, but I mean, I remember when I was, <laughs> so there's this picture, um, 2009, Orlando Magic, San Antonio Spurs, right? It was one of the top, yeah. moments, top moments in Magic history. And I'm underneath the basket with the camera on my shoulder shooting the game, right? 0.8 seconds on the clock, alley Ute pass, Dwight Howard dunks over Tim Duncan. They win the game, end up going to the NBA Finals that year. I actually had that picture signed and up in my uh, in my office at home. And every time I look at that, at every time I look at that picture, I look at myself, and I'm like, I was not representing my brand well. And, and I'm saying that because like I, I felt like I looked sloppy, you know. So when even thinking about your brand, think about how you carry yourself on site, how you interact with your clients, how you interact with other people, technicians, your your colleagues. You know, it, it, it stems all the way down to just being someone well, I, that, yeah, go ahead, you, you go. You well, go. I think you, you, you're hitting the nail on the head and it's an important issue. It's important to remember that really for most people, there's two things. One is how well you push the buttons or hold the camera or get the shot framed up, et cetera. But really more importantly for all of us, and we know this is, how how do you interact with the other people? How do you pro solve problems? How are you a team player? How are you someone that that employer is going to want to have back because you're easy on the job, you do a good job? So the, the those those features right now are in the forefront. You're teaching them in your book, and I think you're right on uh, right yeah. on spec. All that That's intangible exactly. stuff, you know. It's all the <laughs> intangible stuff. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, because you can be a great. You can be skilled, right? You have that, you can have your craft, you have your skill set down packed. Like, you can't deny that. But if you're not likable, you're not coming back. 100%. 100%. You don't want to be the guy that's 15 minutes late. You don't want to be the guy that looks a little sloppy. You don't want to be the guy that forgot to shave on show day. Um, you don't want to be the guy that's a little testy because you work till midnight and you're back at 6 a.m. Right. You got to be on and you've got to be good 100% of the time. Let's transition over to Patrick. Independent contractors aren't salary employees and they don't have regular hours, right? right. So, so therefore, as an independent contractor, you have inconsistent cash flow to manage your life and your bills. What would you say is one of the most important things someone living a 1099 lifestyle should do for themselves to set them up, set themselves up for success? Yeah, Clem, that's a great question. Um, I work in my practice with a lot of self-employed people, a lot of people that get 1099s, and definitely the number one problem that I see is very few of them manage a budget. Um, so a budget is basically a plan. It can take many forms. Some people use accounting software, some people use spreadsheets, some people just you know have it in their head. Um, but a budget is something where you're, you're kind of planning for the future. So a lot of my clients that are 1099, for example, they spent maybe half their careers as W-2 employees. As a W-2 employee, everything's kind of handled for you. Your taxes are being withheld. You just got to kind of worry about how much that paycheck is every two weeks and, you know, decide how much is left over to, to spend on groceries and personal type stuff, right? But when you're self-employed, you have to cover that tax bill. And you have to cover the expenses related to your business. Um, you also have to manage for the fact that you're not going to maybe get that paycheck every two weeks on Friday. It might be uh, a month or two goes by and, and there's a dry spell, or uh, or or, uh, or you're not getting you know the jobs that you that you want to be getting all the time. Um, so that income can be lumpy, can be inconsistent. So a budget 
is it will allow someone who's self-employed to actually put that plan either on paper or in their heads so that they're prepared when there's a dry, dry spell or they're prepared when they get to that tax uh, tax time at the end of the year. Um, you know, because I can tell you probably 50% of my first year as a 1099 clients end up owing a lot more money than they expect because a lot of them think, hey, I'm coming from a job where I'm making seventy, eighty thousand dollars and I just started my career in uh you know, real estate or another, uh, you know, another uh, self-employed position. Um, and I, they only made 30,000, but guess what? You got to pay the self-employment tax on that 30,000. You got to uh, pay a little bit of uh, federal tax on that 30,000. So even though you made less than half of what you did as a W-2 employee, you can end up owing much more. Um, so the budget kind of helps people keep that in check as well as other facets of their life. Yeah. You know, I uh, think about, one of the things that my wife, who you know, you've met, she's a certified public accountant, and one of the things that she forced me to learn and understand because she runs our home and our family like a business, I had to learn Excel. If you're an independent contractor and you don't know how to, to use Excel, if you're a business owner, as an independent contractor, you're a business owner, and you don't know how to use Excel, you're not setting yourself up for success. You know, that's, I, 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 we have on our, on our Klimco, on our Klimco um, website, uh, you can download a basic budget template. And in that, you know, it helps you to kind of learn. And we have a video on YouTube about it as well. You can learn the process of how to, uh, you know, set those things up, put in your jobs. It begins to take out those little amounts. Uh, you know, Patrick, you and I discussed, I had that 60-40 rule as an independent contractor that I, that I teach people. So out of that, that 1099 payment that you receive, no tax is taken out, 60% of that can go toward your um, budget and your bills. And then a minimum of 25 for taxes, 10% for that cushion when times are slow, and that 5% for retirement. Now, like I said, that's just the minimal stuff. That's just kind right. of building that muscle. Um, but you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on just kind of building that cushion and trying to plan for those times where money is just not coming in? Yeah. I mean, at a minimum, that's, that's, that's definitely a great idea. Um, because you're, if you're not keeping that in mind, if you're not keeping in mind the fact that you're going to have other unforeseen circumstances that you're going to have, uh, uh, potentially tax issues, slowdowns, et cetera. Um, what happens is people tend to get into the habit of just treating their 1099 income like it's a paycheck and then they spend it when it comes in. Um, you know, and, and if they don't, if you're not disciplined as a, as a, as a contractor, as someone who's self-employed, um, then, you know, you don't have your, your 401k that your W2 is kicking money into and you don't ever see the money. So it never happens. In fact, that's something that I recommend my clients do is actually set up automatic, uh, set up an automatic payment to either a retirement account, like an IRA or potentially a, a simple employee pension or a SEP. Um, you know, just for example, just to make sure it happens because it's an out of sight, out of mind thing. And that it all goes back to the budget. Yeah. I, I like that you talked about, the IRA and the, and the SEP and st the things like that. And, and we're going to talk to Jason Grundy in a moment because that's, that's kind of up his alley. But you know, also from that budgeting standpoint, you know, budgeting for your own insurance because as an independent contractor and freelancer, that's not being taken care of, you, taken care of for you. So Jessica, um, you know, one of the great benefits a W-2 employee has with working for a company or a corporation is a group health insurance plan. You know, does the what that large group can provide for you know minimizing the cost right is that correct yes clem i mean usually a large employer is going to pay 50 percent of the employee's premium so that makes it much more affordable and it's automatically deducted out of your paycheck so you don't even see the money i mean it's pre-tax dollars as well so it's something that is taking care of you you can cover your spouse and dependents on it if you like to and it's long-term coverage. As long as you work there, you're always going to have health insurance. If you have a independent contractor, freelancer, entrepreneur, small business owner, you know, all of those different, those different categories, single or married with children, maybe not. How do you help them find a plan for them and make them feel comfortable through the process? The first thing I do when I'm introduced to someone is I ask a lot of questions. 
I know that, um, I mean, personally, I've been self-employed and I've thrived in it, although it took a long time. Wish I had known all of you way back then. Um, but I've been self-employed or a small business owner for over 15 years now. So I certainly understand what it's like to pay for your own health insurance. And when you lose that W-2 job, or if you start working for yourself right away and you never have the employer plan offered to you, people don't know where to go. You know, how do I find out? Do I go online? What do I do? So I'm very fortunate and grateful to have a lot of referrals. And thank you, Clem, for sending people my way. Um, but the first thing I do is I research my licensed shops, every health insurance option in any state that I'm licensed in. I'm licensed in 32 states. Um, and I also help people in states that I'm not licensed in. But it's a matter of finding out what a family or an individual or a married couple situation is um, because there's more options than most people realize. And there are you know, private plans that sometimes require medical questions in order to get approved, but the rates are outstanding. And um, you, there's also programs that'll give you a discount based off income. Now, when you're self-employed, that can be very difficult though, because as we all know, income, income goes up and down. It can you know, fluctuate. It's a little hard to predict at times. So you know, I like to ask about you know, doctors that they like to see, do they travel? Are they gonna be traveling all over the country working? They would need a nationwide network. There's lots of different scenarios. So it really depends on who I'm speaking to at the time. But the more information I gather, the more accurate results I can come back with. And the goal is to have several choices that I can sit down and explain to them, explain what they mean, what the person will pay versus what the insurance will pay because the goal for health insurance is not just to cover you for six months, it's to cover you long-term. If you're gonna work for yourself, uh, for your career, you want to get health insurance that covers you for decades. I feel like sometimes health insurance, that's like one of the first things that people cut out of their budget and don't pay for anymore when money gets tight and, and things like, you know, things like that. Is, have you experienced that or seen that? I have, I have. Um, and I've seen quite the opposite too. It, it depends on whether or not you understand the value of health insurance and what it's there for. I have a three-year-old son and he has a fractured collarbone. Didn't expect that to happen either. He's three, but you know, someone fell on him. And between an ER visit, three specialist appointments, two sets of x-rays, that would be very expensive without health insurance. It's your responsibility to take care of yourself. And it's something that all self-employed self-employed people learn. And if they if they don't learn it, then often they you know they find out the hard way later on. I love that, Jessica. It's like I, I love that that you get that, you understand that you're 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 helping people to that's one of the ways of thinking long term, right? That's one of the ways of thinking like, okay, I'm I'm healthy today, but you may not be healthy tomorrow. So you have to think about tomorrow. You have to think about the day after and the month after, the week after, the year after. And, and it's just all, some of that is that preventive maintenance and preparation for what could come. So from that, we're going to transition to my man, Jason Grundy. You know, Jason, you know, thinking long term, we talked about getting started. We've talked about building and supporting your lifestyle, right, through insurance and different things like that. Let's talk about sustaining it. Let's talk about, let's talk about keeping um, and, or setting aside money so that when your mind and your body begin to reject the work that you once loved and you once did, how to prepare financially after that. So my question to you, how important is financial literacy being disciplined with your budget and let's say setting goals for retirement as an independent contractor? How, how important is that? But remember, we're not talking about, we're talking about an independent contractor, not a W-2 employee, someone who has a 401k or a pension, nothing like that. Like, this is all on you. How important is that? I, I'm actually a W-2 employee and a 1099 uh, person. So I live in, in both of those worlds. So I'm going to talk about this from a, from a macro level. You know, I'll say this. If you are, um, if you do what everyone else does, you should expect the same results. Now, and those results may not be bad results, but those are the those should be the expected results. I'll, I'm saying that to preference this. 
um, I'm a person that's in my, in, in my forties and I grew up being taught that you, you plan for retirement when you're at the age of 65. That's what's been pounded into my head. What I do now when I try to, when I coach individuals and when I talk about it, I try to get that out of everyone's head. Don't think about retirement as an age at all. A lip, completely eliminate retirement at an age from your vocabulary. You plan to retire when you have enough money to live off the interest of that money. That's when you should retire. That could be at age 75, 65, 55, 45, 35. I, I, I know, especially in today's world, a lot of individuals that are retiring in their 30s now. And here's the way you want to think about it. You have to think about how much money will it take for you to live comfortably. You know, for some individuals, they could live comfortably off $100,000 a year. If you're going to, if you, if you can live comfortably off $100,000 a year, you may need about a million dollars in, in overall capital or overall in, uh, savings to live off that because interest will, you, you know, if you're assuming that you can get about a 10% interest, you can live off about $100,000. You know, over history, returns have been roughly about seven, but uh, over the last um, three to four years, uh, interest uh, uh, returns on your investments have been actually much, much higher than that if you are. If, if you are with, with the right, uh, uh, if you're getting the right assistance, right? What kind of lifestyle you want first? That's the first thing you should think about. When you retire, what kind of lifestyle you want? And based on that lifestyle, you need to save that much money or invest, because I don't use the word savings when I teach my courses. I think savings is a bad word. No one should be saving anything. You should be investing. Investing is where you get return. When you save, you may get 1% a year if you're lucky, but when you're investing, you get a much higher uh, return on, on your money that you want to put away. But Jason, so how does someone even begin to do that, right? Because you're talking about saving a million dollars. We're talking, I, I want to, I mean, you got to break that all the way down to a budget though. Like, how do you get to the point where you have a million in the bank or any money in the bank? And, and you know, where, where does it start? That's a good question. I think first you start with a great, uh, with a great accountant like Patrick, so he can give you the, 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 the methodology behind what you need to do, because you still have to pay your bills. You still have to run your business your, as an independent contractor. So you begin with a, a great accountant first to, to help you become disciplined. But once you determine how much you can actually put away, that begins the step and determining how long you have to continue to work to, and the amount of money you're putting away uh, to, uh, to, to get to that goal of eventual uh, retirement. You know, I, as, as I mentioned before, I know um, an individual that he started, he, he got disciplined very young. He had great parents and great people around him. He immediately after college, he graduated at 22. And his first job, he worked for a corporation uh, he immediately began saving, you know, he, you know, he had uh, a no debt, you know, he was in a very fortunate situation, but he began saving uh, a large percentage of his money uh, very early in his career, and he ended up retiring at age 35. Now, this, this person is living about off about $50,000 a year. For him, that's a comfortable lifestyle. Uh, I will openly admit that would not be comfortable for me at all, but uh, for him, me, that's, huh? well, well, I just, uh, I have, I have, I have more responsibilities. So, like <laughs> so uh, but for him, that's a comfortable lifestyle. And when we talk about retirement too, I want to make sure we emphasize retirement means that doesn't mean you don't do anything else for the rest of your life. Retirement just means you can look to do other things at that point. You don't have, you can get out of what we call the, the rat race. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, hiking Mount Everest, it starts with one step, right? So it's kind of the same thing with saving for retirement. Uh, you know, most people that are, uh, as we're talking about, I think most people that, a lot of people that jump into self-employment, they started, you know, they started with a W-2 job or something like that. Um, and, you know, the beauty, as somebody who has been, I've been self-employed my entire career. I worked at a grocery store in college and that's it um, as far as my W-2 life. So, you know, what I've really enjoyed about being self-employed my whole career is that, you know, I can look at something that I really want, a new car or whatever have you, and say, well, I can't really afford that now, but I know if I hustle and bust my butt, I can get there and I can, I can get that. And that you can't say that if you're uh, in a lot of different careers, a lot of W-2 type positions um, where, you know, if you're a government employee, for instance, there's the government pay scale and you, 
you know when you're eligible and you for a raise and that kind of thing. Um, but you can't just hustle really hard and get there that much quicker like you can uh, when you're self-employed. So that's kind of the beauty of it. But the downside of it is in that government job or that corporate job, uh, there's usually going to be kind of fail safes in place like 401ks, like pensions, like things like uh, kind of and kind of forced savings um, that that typical commercial, uh, typical corporate jobs and government jobs will give you that being self-employed just isn't there. I mean, you can literally work your entire life and then be like, I'm ready to retire and you got your social mm-hmm. security and that's it. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, right. Cause we don't even, who knows if that'll even be there. So, right. um, so the answer is, you know, you have to start by just being very disciplined in the beginning and it's not something that someone's going to do for you. So, I mean, even if you're just starting off with, Hey, I'm going to put a hundred bucks a month, you know, towards a retirement account or, you know, whether it's a Roth IRA or, or a, uh, or a traditional IRA or even just a brokerage account, um, which is often for my clients and I don't do financial advising. I, I definitely refer that out to, um, professionals, but, you know, I'll even recommend some of my clients, Hey, there's really not a huge benefit to you doing the deferred compensation style retirement plan right now. Just set up a brokerage account and put money in it. And the benefit of that is that it's relatively liquid in case you ever did really need the money in case of emergency. Um, but the bottom line is just start, you know, even even yeah. if it's small. I agree. You got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Just, you know, I think about independent contractors. I think about when I first started in the industry and I was probably making well, 25 maybe 25,000, 30,000, but I had no idea of the value of that dollar, but I had to start somewhere. And, and where I am now, it's just thinking about, okay, had I, started, had I started and planned better then, I'd be more comfortable. I'm still comfortable, but I, I could be better. Think about whole brain thinking. You think about the right brain creative, and you can create anything. You can create the lifestyle that you want to live but then on the left brain side, the, the process and, and the practical side, the analyzing side of it, how do you sustain what you've created? And so that's where I want people to, to, to understand that you, know, you have to look at yourself as an entity, a whole entity, and, and figuring out how to have longevity and your life and your happiness. So yeah. lightning round, here we go, here we go. We've talked about business. We've talked about marketing, branding, taxes, et cetera. We've talked about lifestyle, insurance, sustainability, all of that, right? Let's talk about balance. In theory, we work to maintain our lifestyle. Now, how intentional you are about creating your lifestyle and not letting the lifestyle create you, okay? One by one, what do you enjoy doing just for fun? What brings you peace? What brings you joy? What brings balance to your life? Jessica, I want you to go Um, first. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm a mother. So, um, and I'm kind of waited a long time to have kids, but definitely something that brings me joy like no other is holding and rocking my kids and putting them to sleep. Um, When I used to work in an office, I never put them to sleep. I only saw them in the mornings. Um, and before I had kids, I was just work, work, work. So I would say that's something I get every day, no matter what. And it's a very high value. For me, this is a very easy question. Um, uh, what brings me joy absolutely is my wife. Um, my wife has um, allowed me to live a lifestyle where all I have to do is work. Uh, and, and there are a lot of individuals that have to work and do other things, but my wife takes care of all those other things. So all I have to do is work. And uh, uh, she takes care of everything else. And that brings me a lot of happiness and joy. So when my work is done for the day, I literally don't have to do do anything but make sure that she's happy. So my wife is uh, my rock and my happiness. So nice. I I absolutely agree. My wife is everything to me. But one of the things that um, the things that bring us the most joy, and I'll say us as opposed to me, because we're definitely joined together 24 seven is the volunteer work that we do, the, the mentoring that we do, the mentoring that I do personally, um, anything that is other than trying to earn a dime these days, you know, we're avid gardeners and, you know, grandparents now, but uh, passing on what we've learned to the next generation of professionals in our industries uh, is probably the most satisfying work. 
And the most, um, the thing that gives me the most balance and the most comfort is knowing that you're doing something for somebody else. So volunteering and the mentoring, I think would be, would definitely be my two top hits there. All right, Patrick, what you got for us, buddy? Yeah. So, I mean, I will echo uh, what Jessica had to say, you know, I, I have three kids and, you know, and a wife and, you know, they're all just amazing. And, um, you know, putting them to bed, definitely my favorite part. We love going camping and, you know, seeing the natural world and, you know, spending time outdoors. Um, so, I mean, that's really been, you know, our kind of getaway and, our, and my kind of, you know, center of peace, so to speak, um, has been just spending time with the family and, and camping. And, you know, for me, when, when work's getting really stressful, like it is this time of year, you know, that's my, that's what's in the back of my head, you know, Hey, when we get past the middle of April, uh, we're going to be able to, you know, hop in the RV and, you know, go to the beach or go to the keys or, you know, whatever else, you know, whatever else we can come up with. That's, that's beautiful. And, and, and I guess for me, it's, it's definitely my family is definitely getting that time. It's a lot of just sitting back and, and, and thinking backwards and forward in life. Um, a lot of reflection, a lot of forward thinking, uh, but it's definitely, like, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I guess I named my company after it. You know, it's the coaching, the leading, the educating, and the mentoring side of just trying to teach. Um, and that brings me so much joy of being able to open someone's eyes and, and see something that they didn't see, even in my work, just telling a story from my perspective, showing something from my angle. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I enjoy being a projectionist. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I appreciate you all taking your time to have this conversation with me and for allowing this opportunity for us to share this conversation with so many people that need this, that don't even know that they need this, because I was one of those people. So thank you again, um, Patrick, Tom, Jason, Jessica. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your friendship. And thank you for your professionalism. All right, so thank you for watching this episode of the production channel and being a part of this journey that we're taking here at Clemco. We started off as an AV company and have expanded to providing human resource support and educational resources for independent contractors, freelancers, entrepreneurs, small business owners, or just anyone wanting help in the areas of career development and business management. If you would like to purchase a copy of my book, Career Projection 101, sign up for one of our courses, or be connected to one of our Clemco HR service providers, visit www.clemco.net to see what our network is all about. Again, thank you for listening in on this conversation, and we look forward to connecting with you. At the end of the day, we just want to help you project the best image possible.